Good morning, Avondale College Church. Um, we are the Avondale School Music Department, and we just wanted to uh, welcome you to church and say thank you for dragging yourselves and your families out of bed to come here and worship with us. Hello? Yes. Oh, here we go. We are very, very excited to be here and worship with you today and show off a bit of Avondale School's music talent. So if you could please worship with us. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Let the light 
Good morning, everybody. We are going to sing one of our worship songs, which is a Jericho song. So if you know it, um, great, sing along. If you don't, that's okay, enjoy. And uh, stand with us. Yeah, let's do it. Hey. 
we have another song, is going to be Build My Life. So, yes.
thank you for worshipping with us. Isaiah 41, verse 9 to 10. I took you from the ends of the earth. From the farthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you, and I have not rejected you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will upload, I'll upload, hold you with my righteousness right hand. will be going towards our local budget. And all the money that you generously give today will go to all the ministries here at Avondale University College Church. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be here today as a part of Avondale School Band and Choir and worship you. Please be with all of us as we sing and worship you. Thank you for our friends and families that can be here and please be with anyone who is unable to make it. Please especially be with anyone who is sick at the moment. Thank you for always loving us and that we can come together as a school and a community to worship you. Amen.
shadow comes without the light making a way. No raging storm can ever defy one word of faith. My heart remains sure in the wind, sure in the waves. You are the anchor of my soul. You won't let go. You won't let go. I do. I do like hiking. I'm just, just tired of carrying this pack. Oh, wow. What do you have in that thing? Anything? Here, let's sit under that shady spot under that tree and let's have a look. Whoa, you packed half the world in here. What? Did I take too much stuff? <laughs> you packed three combs, five pairs of socks, I don't know how many sets of batteries, your best shoes, one of your brother's shirts, CDs, headphones. Is there anything from your room you didn't bring? Oh yeah, I left a whole bunch of stuff. Good. Well, it's time we left a few more things. Hey, what are you doing? We're only camping for one night and it's already starting to get dark. You don't need all this junk. Junk? It's not junk. These are my pride possessions. They're my life. Pretty sad life if just things are what matter most to you. What if 
is she saying? I think she means that we came out here to get away from all of this stuff. We came, we wanted to come camping to get away from all the stuff and spend time together. You know what? You're right. You're absolutely right. We don't need any of this stuff. Without that big heavy old thing, I could run miles. Let's go. Awesome. Let's go. Yeah. Stuff. We all sure have a lot of stuff, don't we? The problem is, Jesus d didn't tell us to collect stuff. Go therefore into all the world and collect as much stuff as you can. I don't think so. That verse actually reads, well, let's look it up. Mark 5, 16, verse 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. A little different than get a bunch of stuff, right? The thing with stuff is it weighs us down, like trying to hike with a bunch of things you don't need. We're the same way. We can spend our lives trying to get the latest video game or talking mum into buying just one more snack. As soon as we have it though, we want something else. Now having stuff isn't bad. If we have a lot of toys, we can share them with our friends and have a lot of playing with them, a lot of fun playing with them. But like we discovered, it isn't things that make us happy. It's people and the person that will give you the most joy, no matter what, is Jesus. If we get so caught up in having all the best stuff, we can forget about the most important things like spending time with God and our family. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for your Sabbath day. Please bless our speaker, Mr. Clark. I pray that you will speak through him. In your name, amen. <coughs> Woo. Now this is the face of a proud head of primary. Um, can we give them a, another round of applause? 
Well done, guys. Absolutely. Um, I'm sat at the front there with Mrs. Cooper. She's the principal of Avondale School. I'm, um, as I said, Stuart Clark, the, the head of primary. Um, and on, on behalf of both of us, we want to thank you so much for the invitation here um, to be able to share in this uh, wonderful church and community. We are so proud of our students. We are so grateful for our amazing music teachers and teachers as they've been involved in getting all this ready for us to just have this time of worship. There's something beautiful and sweet about just the voices of children singing to God, is there not? Oh, mercy. Let's just give them an hour of a round of applause. I mean, whew. I can see Mrs. Ferris here is, as well. She's the head of secondary. And um, I just want to just mention at this point before we get in, in, into the word, if you have a, a school-aged child who isn't part of our school community and there's some obstacle that means that they're not able to, uh, that, that maybe you've seen that they're not able to join um, our school, please come in and speak to us at the end. We want every single child who wants to experience a Christian education with us uh, to be part of our school. And we'll knock any roadblocks out of the way to make that so. Um, our primo number one thing is students meeting Jesus. That's what our school exists for. And so um, if um, you want to talk to us about that, please, uh, yeah, just come and see us at the end. Now, I've got to tell you something that you never knew about me. And that is, I'm originally from England. And I say this because I know my accent is failing me. I know that it moves occasionally into voices like this. And I talk about barbecues and stuff like that, mate. Um, and I go to Bunnings a lot, so I think that's where I'm being calibrated. Um, so my, my accent fluctuates in and out, but when I did grow up in the UK, there was a thing I like to do called bog running. And I've shared this with others, and I know that when I say that in Australia, it means maybe something else, but it doesn't in England, so think differently. Bog running is basically jogging, but as you know, um, like we've experienced lately here, a lot of rain means a lot of mud, bog. And so you go for a lovely, friendly jog, and you get stuck in mud, bog running. But that's what you need to do for exercise. Now, I had a friend, his name's Stevie. I'm six foot two, he was five foot four. I have size 11 feet. He had size 13 feet. He looked like Krusty the Clown. <laughs> Wherever he would go, just flipping around with his big feet. But with those humongous feet of his and small body, that white boy could fly. Ah! Basketball, dunks, jumps everywhere. It was impressive what he could do with those big flipper feet. One of the other things he liked to do is show off. Now, I realize that's not a very male thing to do, um, but occasionally he liked to show off. And so on this uh, day, we were bog running, running along, and he could clear fences with those big flipper feet, just like pew, sah, and fly over things. It was amazing. And so um, we're running along, and we come up to this point where uh, there's the fencing. Now, in the UK, all farmers must allow access to their property, so you're allowed to run through their property. And we come up to this point here, and there's the little sty part, which you can step over and do one of those and, and go through. But Stevie, well, he can fly. So, of course, you jump that fence. So as he's running along, he sees it, the flipper feet kicks in, He's starting to soar through the sky, and now he's soaring through the sky. And as he's flying in the air, he's looking at me with that kind of like, oh, yeah. And I'm looking at him going, oh, okay, fair enough, fair enough. And he's soaring through, and then his foot has gone over the front of the fence. He's cleared it, but his back big flipper foot has caught the bottom of the fence. This made me smile. 
Now, there's a couple of options when your foot gets caught on the bottom of a fence. You can either fall uh, forward on your face, ouch, that hurts a lot, or you can scissor straight down. <laughs> Option number two happened. This made me even more happier. He scissored straight down on the fence. Now, like here, uh, the UK has multiple different inventions. We also invented electric fences. <laughs> so now he is scissored down on top of the electric fence. And there is rain, there is water, because that is a English tried normality of existence that it is raining. He is wet, he is scissored down on the fence, and I smile even more. He now falls forward. I run over to him, and he just is going, Ee! like the, the buzz of the fence. Ee! And I look at him in complete care and concern, and I say, <laughs> you got electrocuted. It is time and time again that we find ourselves in these moments that you have been given a beautiful gift. But sometimes it goes really wrong and you can lay flat out going, whoa, what happened there? Oh, I should have cleared that. I've got an amazing gift. And there he is, sprawled out going, I do not know what happened. All I know is that precious things have been impacted. There is moments that we have been given gifts and it's always about what uh, that journey looks like. Those moments with those gifts and then those gifts sometimes are tested and when they are tested, sometimes we fail. You have been given a gift and you are tested sometimes and sometimes you fail. There is um, a, a famous story in Scripture, and I'm going to have to do a little bit of a, 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 a quick summary up to this point in the Scripture. It is of uh, Abraham. Now, Abraham was given uh, uh, this promise by God, if, if you're new to the Bible. He's given a promise to God saying, hey, um, I want to make you into a great nation. The only problem is, is that your wife can't have children. Big problem. So I'm going to ask you to go off into the great land and you're going to trust me. Abraham goes off into the great land, incredibly not following different instructions, tries to give away his wife at one point, says, he's, you know, this is my sister, so she's free. You can just take her and stuff like that because it's, it's not working out for me. He does all these weird things in regards to the promise and doesn't listen to God about the promise when it come. And then eventually he takes it into his own hands and he says, you know what? I'm going to deal with this situation. So he gets a, another wife and gives her a child and says, sorted. I've fixed this one. And God's like, no, 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 no. I'm the one giving you the promise. Now, for those that know the Bible well, know that I've done an incredibly fast summary up to that point because I want to go down to a text. If you know the story well, you know where we're up to in the story. If you're new to the Bible, I'm happy to explain all that rest of it to you at another point. So God comes along and gives him the child of promise called Isaac. This is born of his first wife, Sarah. And she now has Isaac, the promised one from God. And Abram has actually pushed away Hagar and Ishmael and sent them away because now he's got the promised child. And then the Bible says this. It says, um, it says I'm getting old and I can't read things without my glasses. No, there they are. I apologize, everyone. This break's brought to you from Sanitarium. All so good, always. Sorry. So, planted. Uh, it says that Abraham planted uh, a a tamarisk at uh, Beersheba and evoked there the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham uh, resided in the land of the Philistines a long time. What a beautiful picture. Abraham sat there 
He's got all that he ever wanted under a tree, relaxing. It's beautiful. It's an amazing moment. Then God, it says, sometime afterward, God put Abraham to the test. He said to him, Abraham, and he answered, here am I. It's um, this moment where he's been given all the gifts and he's been given everything and then God comes along and puts him to the test after he's received the gift. But the word that actual, um, that's actually used is hinene, which you can try and lock in your mind. Hineni. I'll say it right this time. Hineni. Now, Hineni is a Hebrew word for behold I. So not here I am, but behold I. And what it means is not like when you say to a teenager, um, can I get your attention while they're on their mobile phone? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. They're not really there. Or when you say, can you empty the dishwasher? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not going to happen. This Hineni means I am present, like a, a soldier on the line about to go over the top at the trenches. Very present in this moment. I am fully here, ready to serve. God comes along and says, hey, um, Abraham. And he says, Hineni, behold I. He's present. He's listening. He's fully committed to about, about what God's about to say. God says, take your son, the favored one, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the heights that I will point out to you. So God comes along to him and says, you know the, uh, the thing I've given you, the precious gift. The test is I want you to go and burn it. That would be rather interesting, don't you think? You say, behold I, and you'd be like, oh, I'm not too sure about that. Um, I've received the gift, and now, now, and now the test comes. Uh, how will I respond uh, to this moment? But um, Abraham is ready. Abraham will serve. It is um, God calling him after he's received the gift. What will he do with the gift? Um, we have this policy at school. Um, you do the test first, then you get the mark. We don't uh, usually give you the A and then go, oh, and now, and now we'll do a test to see how, how it goes. But this is what God does. He's given him the gift, and now comes the test to see whether or not the free gift is, is, is worthy of, of, of the guy in this moment. God has given it to him, and now the test comes. Imagine if um, you're a Seventh-day Adventist here uh, this morning and someone came and uh, you've been baptized and then the test comes. I'm going to ask you 29 fundamental beliefs. Ah, it tricks you. It's actually 28. Ah, see, you already got you on problem number one. Um, I'm going to ask you to go through the whole list of the uh, 28 fundamental beliefs that you, you signed up for. You'd be like, oh, okay. Let's go for this one. Um, and number one, the Holy Scriptures. Number two, the Trinity. Number three, uh, God the Father. Number four, the Son. Uh, then the Holy Spirit. And ooh, dearie me, I'm going to uh, creation. Um, and then you start going, oh, I'm starting to run out now. And then maybe you've got to number nine and you're going life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And eventually you may get to number 28 and be like, oh, the new earth. And uh, you're like, whew, I passed the test. I get to remain. Uh, no, I think you'll probably just start crying, hey? Um, because we always know that the gift was free. But here, Abraham has received the gift of the son, and the test comes. Abraham's standing there. Hineni, behold I. 
And God says something really interesting. I'm reading from the, the Hebrew of the Tanakh here. He says to him, take your son, please. He says, nay. Now, I know in the English versions there, it doesn't say the word please, because it doesn't want to write that God said, please, I beg you. God says it five times in the Old Testament, and every time it's when he wants to ask someone to do something that's unbelievably ridiculous. Take your son as a burnt offering. So God says, take your son, nay, please, your favored one, as a burnt offering. And off Abraham goes. He, he saddled the donkey. He took two of his servants with him. He split the wood for the burnt offering, and he set out to the place which God had told him. And then it says, and then, um, boy or may is she on the third day, which is Hebrew for this day of victory. On the third day, which of course Jesus shows as well in the New Testament. On that third day, something amazing is going to happen. On the third day, it says, Abraham looked up and saw the place from afar. He has his son. He has the gift. The test, he is on the journey. He is serving and following God. When Abraham saw that, he said to his servants, stay here. Me and the boy will go ahead and we will worship and will return to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on his son Isaac. He himself took the, uh, the fire stone, the knife, and the two walked off together. Then Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father. And Abraham answered, Hineni, behold I. Abraham responded with that deep sense of presence for God and now responds to his son the same. He says, Father. And he says to his son, behold I. I'm there, I am here for you, my boy. And it says, here is the fire stone for the wood, but, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will see uh, that the sheep is for the burnt offering, my son, and the two of them walked on together. Imagine you've been given this this gift and now you're being asked to take it back. Now, as I mentioned, I'm uh, originally from the UK and the UK has a really weird policy about certain things. Um, it's called finders keepers. Um, so at one point when we weren't so tiny, um, we were an empire, as we know. And so we were going off on a little journey around the world and anything that looked pretty, we collected and sent back to a museum. So we'd go into a beautiful civilization and go, that looks nice, we'll take that, stick it in the museum. So now when I get to go back to the UK, which my family and I are hoping to do at the end of this year, um, to just go on a holiday, we like to go to the British Museum, which is basically full of a whole load of stuff that we've nicked. Um, we've nicked it from everywhere. And if, I don't know, if you had a, a, a family member um, who uh, generations before liked to collect people's plates from their house um, and it was in your house and they came and knocked on your door and they said to you, hey, your great grandpa, he nicked a whole load of plates, um, here's all the pictures, all the paperwork proving these are my family heirlooms, you'd say, I'm terribly sorry. That's obviously your family stuff. Here it is, we apologize. No, not us. Uh, we keep all the stuff we've stolen in the museum and we apply the finders keepers rule, uh, which is people can come there and it's like, no, 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 no. It'll stay in the museum, even though it's your treasured possessions. Um, so mainly now the British Museum is full of tourists going to see their own stuff um, from their own country and culture. Um, because there's this kind of immaturity of not giving it back, even though it belongs to them. This is not Abraham's problem. It's not his problem at all. He's understood the gift, and he's saying, behold I, and he's walking with the thing that he treasures the most up that mountain. He gets, 
to the point of sacrifice. He builds an altar, he binds his son, he places him on the altar, and he has a blade ready to sacrifice his son. And the Lord called out to him, Abraham, Abraham. And he responds, Hineni, behold I. Three times. Abraham is present at the beginning of the test. He is present for his son questioning what's going on. And now, right now, in this moment, with blade risen, he is present once again. Behold I, listening, fully in this moment, ready to serve. And he says to him, don't worry. Don't worry about your boy. You don't need to take his life. And then it says in Scripture that Abraham looks up and sees once again. Just like before where Abraham had um, stood um, and looked up in Moriah up at the mountain of the place to go to for sacrifice. Once again, he looks up and he sees the ram. And God has provided the solution. The story is one of worship. And it's interesting because you're saying, so, well, why is that, Stuart? Um, why is it one of worship? It is the first time that worship is written in Scripture. It is the first time that we fully understand what it is to worship God. He says um, to the servants, um, you stay here. The boy and I will go up there. We will worship and return to you. I know um, this analogy works here a lot. When you worship a sports team, uh, you wear the, the shirt, you cheer, the, you cheer and make the noises, you jump up and down, you look like them, you dress, you're dressing in the way they do. Um, you may not be as fit as those players, but you definitely give it a good go as you kick around a soccer ball or throw a rugby ball. You want to imitate the people that you, that you worship. Or maybe if you um, worship a, a, a certain style of music, you will dress that way. You'll grow your hair long. Not an option for me, so I don't get that choice. But you'd grow your hair long if it's about growing your hair long and moving your head backwards and forwards or whatever it might be. Or if it's to look like you're very sad about the entire world of existence. That's how you would dress, to mimic the group that you really enjoy. That's what we do as we worship and connect. Worship is to find yourself in a place of reverence for something. And so Abraham says, I will go and worship. Behold I, very present in this moment, listening, and I will go and worship God. And what is it to worship God? This is a challenge I want to give you. It isn't to copy a certain style of music that you like. It isn't to copy a certain style of message that you like. It's to be like Jesus, to walk like Jesus, to follow your God with fear and the beauty and majesty of his gift. How is it shown in here in the first time worship is said as a word? There is a boy walking up a mountainside with the sacrifice of wood on his shoulders, ready at the top. God saying, I will provide the sacrifice as Isaac looks like the, the precursor to what Jesus will do. Walking up the mountainside about to give his life for all of our sins to set us free. Worship, worship, worship. Worship as he walks up that hill is that moment where you're going to give your life, your life to serve God. Grace and mercy, freedom and truth. What a gift it is that we see that Abraham is willing to do, that there is this gift of, uh, uh, of being in this moment to behold God and to see the beauty that he is. 
I don't know um, this morning as um, you've listened to uh, beautiful uh, music as kids have sung. I don't know what brings you here to this point as you've heard uh, kids singing and praising God. I don't know what it is in regards to your journey with Jesus. But may you find yourself just saying, Hineni, behold I, paused in the moment, ready to receive what God wants to say for you on a journey to call you to his great adventure. Let's hand it over to some beautiful music um, from our school. Oh. 
face Jesus is there a greater vision of grace in a moment we shall be changed yes in a moment we shall be changed in a moment we shall be changed That was beautiful, ladies. Thank you. Um, just before I pray, I just want to acknowledge someone that's incredibly important to our school community in time, uh, Pastor Mel, Mel Lemke. He uh, was a man who um, showed a pinnacle of what it was to do ministry, to have time for people, to show love and respect and grace and mercy always. And we will, we will miss him, but know that um, on that great day when we all get to heaven, the crown uh, and the, the mansion ready for that man. Um, it would be spectacular. Um, but he'll be inviting everyone over um, to spend time and have a chat. Um, an amazing man of ministry. And, and we just thank that he was part of our school uh, community. And we know that it's been a real impact upon uh, many lives here as, as well. Let's pray. Beautiful Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, uh, for your love, for... Um, all that you have done for us. And we ask that we can be in moments where we just behold who you are and hear your voice and are called into new areas, into new spaces that you desire for us to be. We always want to be um, just like children, singing praises from a heart and a desire to worship you and to, and to show the love that we have for you, Lord. And so we ask for that, Lord. And we thank you for these amazing students today who have uh, given time to worship you, Lord. But we also ask, Father, that we're challenged always to just not mimic things around us, but to stand with the gifts that you have given us ready to serve, ready to walk, ready to mirror and be an example of your Son. Jesus gave it all, and he set us free. And we just ask that we can be like him, that that is our worship, to reflect him, to copy the way that he walked on this earth, and to accept that the gift was given first, that the gift of grace and love and mercy is ours. So we thank you, Lord, and we give you praise for that. And we thank you that Jesus has set us free. And in that freedom, we have worshipped you today. In your name we pray. Amen.